Heavenly Father, certainly the Lord Jesus Christ means everything to us. As we look at your sacrifice in our behalf and the promises that you've given that you're coming back, Lord, may may we be aware of the times that we're living in. Give us the insight that we need to lay hold of the promises of God, to walk with you by faith, to prepare our hearts for the soon return of our Lord. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, during this presentation, this series, and the one before this, We have been looking at Revelation, the 17th chapter. It's what we've been looking at, the 17th chapter of Revelation, a very, very important one. Because as I mentioned, this is the last one in which God pictures the different nations as beasts, and He says what's going to happen, what's going to take place. And so this is going to be the final conflict that takes place And you and I need to be aware of it. If you study prophecy as we should, then you ought to be like someone who is watching a play. And you should know every actor, and you should know exactly what's going to take place. Because God has revealed that in His Word. That's what He's given you. So you and I need to study prophecy because it reveals to us what's coming what's going to take place. So when we look at Revelation, the 17th chapter, verse 9 says, Here is a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other's not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time and systematically The last presentations and these, we went through these kings. Five have fallen. We've looked at each one of those. We've talked about them. And then we've come down and established who the one is. And we looked at the one who was to come. So we've established those seven. And it says that when this seventh one comes along, he will continue what? Short time. So you and I need to understand that this is not long compared to the others. It's going to be a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So now we come to this eighth beast, the beast that was, okay, is not, is also himself the eighth and is of the seven. Okay, so he's giving you clues as to who this beast is so that you can begin to understand exactly who he represents. Now, in the Bible, God simply uses a woman to represent a church. That's what God uses all the way through Scripture. A woman is used to represent a church. In fact, it says that when Jesus comes back, He's coming back after his bride. And in Revelation, the 12th chapter, or excuse me, in Jeremiah here, the 6th chapter, it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. When it's talking about the daughter of Zion, it's talking about the church. He's comparing her to that. And in Revelation 12, you have a woman that is a good woman that we'll look at. God uses her to represent a church. And he gives this comparison here in Ephesians to you and me. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for her. So he's telling you this is an illustration that he's using because the next verse says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he just simply takes a woman and says, I'm going to use a woman to represent my church. When he talks about nations, what does he use? 
beast. Quite a difference in there. Yeah. He uses beast to represent nations. When he comes to his church, he said, I'm going to use a woman to represent my church. And so in Revelation 12, you have this woman. Now there's a great sign in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, on, a head, on her head a garland of 12 stars. This represented God's church. The woman says that she was standing on the moon, representing the Old Testament period that she was coming out of. It says that she was clothed with the sun, representing the gospel in all of its glory as it was coming out. And it says that she had on her head a garland of 12 stars, which represented the 12 apostles that the gospel went out from. So here is his church, and he's using that to represent uh, God's people, the church in the last days. Now, in Revelation, the 17th chapter, you have another woman, okay? So if you have a woman representing a church, a good woman would represent a what? Good church. Bad woman would represent? Bad church. Okay? Well, let's see what it says about this woman here in Revelation, the 17th chapter. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bows came and talked to me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the what? The judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Okay, so this woman, not a good woman, because it says that she's a great harlot, okay, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this woman... Harlot, she, wine of her fornication, and goes on and says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman setting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So notice, this woman, who is a harlot and full of blasphemy, is setting on this beast. Okay? which has seven heads, ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Okay, so it's not describing a pure woman here. It's describing someone that's very, very bad. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. Now, I just want to give you something to think about. This woman who's sitting on this beast that's full of abominations, that, as it says here, is the great harlot, it says that she is the mother of harlots. Now, if she's the mother of harlots, what does that mean? Well, it means she has daughters. Okay? That's simply what it means. She has daughters. Okay? You need to think about that a little bit because we'll touch it just a little bit as we go on. The mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. John saw her riding on this scarlet-colored beast and he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He said, I marveled with great amazement. Now, in these texts that we have just read, God gives you four points of identification so that you don't have to be in any doubt as to who this woman represents. You don't have to say, well, I wonder who it's talking about. It's very, very clear as you look at these four points of identification. So let's take a look at them and see what it says about them. First one has to be a what? World power with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. So, dear friend, you can't say this woman in Revelation 17 represents some little church off over here by itself. I mean, there's no way it can be that. It has to be a church that has been involved in, yeah, with the whole world, with the kings of the earth. So you've got to look at a power that has had 
dealings, had worked with all the major powers. And, of course, when you take a look at that, there's no other power that has done that other than the papal power. She has had dealings with the kings all across the earth. One point. All right, let's go on. Well, I don't know. Okay, second point. It leads the world astray from God's word. In other words, it's got to be a church that has led people away from a clear, thus saith the Lord. Because it says, the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, when it's talking about the wine of her fornication, it's talking about teaching contrary to God's word. In fact, it says that she leads them into fornication, into adultery. How do you commit spiritual adultery? How, how do you do that? Because it says this is what she does. Well, you commit spiritual adultery by adulterating this word. In other words, when I teach something that is contrary to the Word of God, I am adulterating the Word of God. That is spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. And that's what this woman has done. She has led them contrary to the Word of God. And for the last few nights, I have taken you step by step down through history, and I have showed you case after case where she was leading the people contrary to what God's Word and such men as Huss, Jerome, Wycliffe, Zwingli, Luther, Knox, all these men standing up and saying, no, this is not what God's Word says, calling the people back. So it's clear what she's done. But let's go on to the third point. The persecuting power. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of Jesus. This had to be a power that persecuted. And I have shared with you the last couple nights how indeed she has done this. If you have questions about this, folks, then I invite you to go to the library. Uh, check out such books as Fox Book of Martyrs. Or check out uh, The History of the Reformation by D'Aubigné. Or The History of Europe by Quabbin. Or Here I Stand by Bainton. Uh, check out some of those books and read them. They will tell you exactly what happened, what took place. History tells us that this power killed somewhere between 100 and 150 million people. So when we're talking about persecution of the saints, indeed, it has done that. Okay, the fourth point. Not only would it persecute, burning people to stake and so forth, but it says it would unite church and state because it says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now, in Scripture, a woman represents what? Represents a church. Okay? In Scripture, a beast represents what? Okay, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Medo Persia. So when you pick up the Word of God and hear a woman is riding on a beast, what do you have? Well, you have uniting of church and state. Because you have church and you have state coming together. And so this is a uniting of church and state. Very, very important that you and I understand that because that figures in very strongly to the last days. Because you have a power now that is the unification of church and state coming together. All right, let's continue on and see. The eighth beast. We're going to take a look now at this eighth beast, identify it, and what the Scripture has to say about it. Here is a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. 
There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other's not yet come again. I want to tell you, when you read this about these seven kings, five have fallen, one is, one is yet to come, you have to look at it from John's perspective. You cannot look at it from here. And you, I'll just say this to you right now because we'll come to it in a moment. You can't look at it, folks, from John on the island of Patmos. If you try to understand this prophecy, looking at it from John on the island of Patmos, you won't understand it. Okay? You got to look at it from John's point of view. Okay? And John is saying, five have fallen. One is. One is yet to come. That was his point of view. The beast that was... Now, please don't take this text and try to think that he's explaining the seven. He's not. He's talking about the eighth. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So now he's given us ideas or clues concerning who this one is. Something very important here. If you look at the beast in Revelation, the 13th chapter, in verse 18, it makes this statement. It says, here is a mind that has wisdom. Okay? When you get to the beast in Revelation, the 17th chapter, in verse 9, it says, here is a mind that has wisdom. Uses that term for though both those beasts. Please understand there is a connection between these beasts. There's a connection between what the beast described in Revelation 13 and the beast being described in Revelation 17. Those two kind of go together. All right. So, he carried me away in the spirit into the... Whoa. Did you catch that? Huh? Did you get it? He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Where is John? In the wilderness. See, not on the island of Patmos. He has been carried in the spirit into the wilderness. What does he see in the wilderness? And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So he is carried in the spirit, in vision, if you please, into the wilderness. And when he's there in the wilderness, he sees these beasts and he says, five have fallen, one is, one's yet to come. So you have to look at it from his view, where he's at, and he is in the wilderness. That's where he's looking at it from. Okay, five have fallen. We looked at those five that have fallen. One is... So if John is there at the time where one is, then where is he? Well, he's at the time of atheistic communism. That's where he's seeing everything from. He's seeing five have fallen, one is, one's yet to come. That's what he's talking about. All right, let's look at this. The beast that you saw was... Still yet, John's point of view, he said, the beast that you saw was, it what? Is not. Where was it during the time of atheistic communism? Napoleon sent his general in, overthrew the papal power. Was not. Okay? And will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was, okay, is not, and yet is. Okay, so let's take a look, see what that is. When he says the beast that was, what tense is that? That's past tense. All right, is not would be what? Be present. 
yet is, would be, would be future. Those are the three. Okay, so John is talking about this beast. All right, now, let's see what is involved here. Here is a mind that has wisdom. The mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are set in mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other's not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Now, folks, not hard to, not hard to arrive at who this beast is. You can do it very simply by the process of elimination. And just by eliminating things, you can find out exactly who it's talking about without any trouble at all. And that's what we're going to do here this evening. We're just going to do a process of elimination and find out. Because it says, five have what? Fallen. And as we have studied God's Word, looked at it, we looked at those five. And by the way, these beasts have how many heads on them? Seven heads. And those seven heads are seven heads of different beasts. And one of the beasts that we looked at was a lion. And we found out that that represented Babylon in Daniel the seventh chapter. Represented Babylon. And Babylon existed from 609 to 539 B.C. And it was overthrown by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia came in, overthrew Babylon, took over also described in Daniel the seventh chapter as a bear. Remember? Had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, which represented the countries that it overthrew. Medo-Persia was overthrown by Greece. Find that also in Daniel 7. And in Greece, we find it ruled from 331 B.C. to 168. This power is pictured as a leopard, which had four wings, which represented the swiftness with which Alexander the Great took everything. And it had four heads, which represented the four generals of Alexander who took over the kingdom when he died. Okay? But Greece fell to pagan Rome. And still in Daniel, the seventh chapter. And pagan Rome ruled from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. She ruled during that period of time. And then we find that papal Rome overthrew pagan Rome in 538 A.D. And she ruled to 1798. Five have fallen. That's the five that have fallen. All those are, in John's point of view, what? Past. All those are past. Okay. Let's continue on. Papal Rome fell to atheistic communism. Napoleon sent his general Berthier into Rome, overthrew the papal power, established a secular one, and out of that came atheistic communism existed. That was the sixth one. And it ruled until basically 1991, at which time, through the work of Reagan and the Pope, they overthrew communism, and thus we have the beast that was to come, which was that of the United States, pictured here in Revelation, the 13th chapter. Those are the seven, okay? So you have them lined up, the seven different beast. Now, as I mentioned, we can do this simply by the process of elimination. The beast that was and is not is himself also the what? The eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Okay, so let's look at points of identification. Eight points the scripture gives you to identify exactly who this power is. One, it says this beast would is one of the seven. So we don't need to go looking anywhere else, do we? 
No, we don't have to go looking at some other place. It's identified that this beast, the eighth, is one of the seven, and it could certainly be any of the seven because they're there, okay? But let's go on. Tells us that it was the beast that what? Was. Now, if it says that it's a beast that was, then what does that do? Now, you've got to think. You know, I had a professor in school that said it was neither harmful nor fatal to think. <laughs> and, and so, you've got to turn the wheels a little bit. If it says this eighth beast was, what does that do? That eliminates two of these beasts. It eliminates atheistic communism and eliminates the United States. Why? Because John is seeing this. This is from his point of view. Therefore, those two beasts disappear. And it's left. It has to be one of those five. Because as far as John was concerned, one is, the other was yet to come. Those were not past. So when he says this beast was, meant that it was in the past. All right, let's go on. Is not. Okay, had to be, had to be one of those five that there was a time in which it was not. Well, there's a time when all five of them is not. So, you know, that's not enough yet. We've got to keep adding things to it. Is himself, is himself also the eighth. So he's telling us clearly, one of these five is going to be the eighth one. One of those five is the eighth one. Had to make war with the saints. Well, in some degree, most all five of those made war with the saints. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't too great on the Hebrew people. And you come right on down there. All of them had some part to play concerning God's people. So that in itself is not enough. Uniting of church and state. Bringing church and state together. What did that just do? Huh? Well, that eliminated four of them. Just like that. Because you have to find a power that has all these characteristics that we're talking about tonight and also have church and state coming together. That it did. All right? Had to receive a deadly wound. And that deadly wound had to be healed. Only one power fits all those points. And the only power that fits that is papal Rome. Nobody else. Dear friend, you can take it, look at it any way you want to. But that's the one that fits it. No other one fits it. Okay. Now, if it's papal Rome, what is she going to do? The eighth beast, papal Rome. What does the scripture say is going to happen? Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you where I stand. I've looked at prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in this book, and every last one of them have been fulfilled as God said. If all of them had been fulfilled as God said, you better believe I'm going to take my stand that these in the very last days are going to be fulfilled just exactly like the Scripture says. You can stake your life on it. It will happen just as God said it would. All right. Revelation 17, 12. The ten horns which you saw are... Ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the what? The beast. Pick up your Bible. Go and take a look. Daniel, the second chapter, talks about the image having ten toes. And it says clearly, those ten toes are ten kings, is what it tells you. Go to Daniel, the seventh chapter, and the beast there has ten horns. 
And it tells you that those ten horns are ten kings. Go to Revelation, the 12th chapter, and you have a beast there, and it has ten horns that represent ten kings. Go to Revelation, the 13th chapter, and the first beast, and that beast has ten horns which represent ten kings. Go to Revelation, the 17th chapter, and that beast has ten horns, which it tells you are ten kings. What I'm trying to get across to you is those ten kings in each case is the same. They represent the nations of Western Europe. Now, what becomes extremely interesting, if you're looking at it, folks, it says... These ten kings, it's ten horns, these ten kings that have received no authority as yet, okay, they will receive authority for one hour as kings with the what? Okay, so it says that these nations of Western Europe are going to be in league, if you please, with the papal power. So if you're looking for what's going to happen. If you're looking for where we're headed, then keep your eyes open because it makes it very clear that Western Europe is going to be in league with the papal power. Okay, let's take it a step farther. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Folks, these are of one mind. It does not say that these ten kings are all the same. It says they're of one mind. Have you ever heard of the European community? In fact, they have, you know, their poster. And they talk about how it is one voice. They speak one mind. Working together. This is exactly what it's talking about. The time in which you and I are living today, you are seeing it with your own eyes. It's in formation. And we, <clears throat> we can't just sit there and not realize where we are. What's happening today? This is what is taking place there. Let's go on. We talked in our last presentation about the United States, and we found out that this beast, the two-horned beast, what it would do, listen to what it says about the two-horned beast and what it's going to do. And he, that's the two-horned beast, the United States, and he exercised all the authority of the first beast. Who is the first beast? Yeah, it's papal Rome, the beast that was, okay? Authority of the first beast in his presence and caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So now you're going to get a picture that you've got Western Europe giving their power and authority to papal Rome, and now the Scripture tells us that the U.S. is going to come along and she too it's going to support it. So you've got two major factors, two major powers that are putting their power and authority into papal Rome. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and lived saying that this beast, this two-horned beast, the United States, going to make an image to the beast. And we found out that the beast was the woman riding on this scarlet-colored beast, which represented unification of church and state. And so when it says the U.S. will make an image, it's saying the United States is going to bring together church and state. That is coming together. And it says that ask the world to follow it. It says this about it. And he granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. 
What does that mean? When it says he was given power to give breath to the image of the beast. Huh? Well, haven't you, haven't you ever read the story of Pinocchio? They made it come to life. That's what it's saying. He gave breath to make it live. Made an image to the beast. Meant to make it, give it life to make it live. Listen to what he does to it. And, and he granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Well, you remember. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in which they were told that they had to worship that statue out on the plains of Dura. And they told Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow down to your image, Nebuchadnezzar. We're not going to do that. And he said, if you don't, I'm going to throw you in the fire furnace. And they said, well, uh, God can deliver us from the fiery furnace. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship your image. Now, listen, folks, it says here, the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. When it uses those words, speak and cause, and we're talking about a nation, we're talking about a power, we're talking about a government, and it uses the word speak, that word speak means legislation. It means they will legislate it. They will force it. It will take place. And then it says that cause means enforcement. And so it's telling you clearly that as we approach the last days, you're going to see church and state come together, and you're going to see religious laws go into effect. I told you earlier, never. Write it down. Go back and check me out. Never in the history of this world has church ever got involved in government that she hasn't persecuted. Never has failed. And it won't fail this time. These will make war with the Lamb. These will make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. It says that they're going to make war with Christ. He's going to come back. It says that God has a controversy with the nations, and he's going to come back, and it says they're going to make war with him. But they won't overcome him, friends. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's coming soon. Tis almost time for the Lord to come. I hear the people say, the stars of heaven are growing dim. It must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone, the day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight as we realize where we are. In the stream of time we realize it won't be long until Jesus will be coming we pray Lord that each of us may be faithful that we may stand on your word 
that we may have faith in what you say, that we may realize that no matter what people have to say, it's what does the Word of God say that counts. Give to us wisdom. Give to us understanding. Give to us faith that we may be faithful and that we might follow you each day. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Tomorrow, our next presentation will be on the mark of the beast. We'll see what is taking place. Good night. God bless you. A coal miner of old believed